SBU is the Spina Bifida Association's new viral education program. Our goal is to bring the world's best care providers and resources directly into your home. SBU is the only free webinar series dedicated solely to the educational, employment, social, self-advocacy, and health needs of people with spina bifida. We hope that you will enjoy this presentation, Maintaining Renal Health in Spina Bifida. This session was recorded at the 2010 Spina Bifida Learning Conference hosted by the Spina Bifida Association of Alabama and the Children's Hospital of Alabama. Please be sure to take time to complete the evaluation at the close of the presentation. Well, thank you. I think I know everybody here, <laughs> almost. So. This is almost going to be like you're in clinic. Uh, let's see what I did with this. Oops. All right. So what we're going to talk about is the importance of preserving kidney function. And most of you are in various stages of trying to do that. And what I'm going to try to do is just talk about the, the hurdles that we go through and what we look at as urologists. And if you take all the babies that we see in the newborn period, 90%, 90% plus, are going to have normal kidneys. And if you did absolutely nothing over the next five years, 50% will deteriorate. And it's just a matter of the function of the bladder. It's all cause and effect. The bladder's not working, and so that puts pressure and problems on the kidneys. So what I want to try to do today is talk a little bit about, just very briefly, about what normal bladder is, so that you can kind of understand what happens when it's abnormal. And then the, the key points that we look at for problems. So the various hurdles in the newborn period, really the hurdle is just the bladder itself and how it's functioning. And we look for adverse effects that the bladder might have on the kidneys. As the children get older in the toddler group, again, there's not much active that we're doing, but there are various things that can occur. If a child's having symptomatic urinary infections, there's a reason for that. We'd want to investigate it. But we can sometimes see some changes in the kidney because of a tethered cord. And that's sometimes the first indication that there's a problem. And it may be very subtle. And you may, as a parent, may not recognize that as a problem. And that's one of the reasons why we'll repeat our urodynamic studies, which I think most of you have lived through. And we do that as a baseline in the newborn period, and then we follow it. Even if the kids are doing well the first three or four years, because that's when their spine and their body is growing the greatest at the fast, fastest rate. And if there is any scarring or tethering, that's when it's going to occur the quickest. As the kids get older and they get in the age where you start thinking about continence, there's a lot of things that we do that can achieve continence but can jeopardize the kidneys. So we'll talk about that. Then the kids, believe it or not, go through the teen years, and that's a big hurdle for transitioning care and potential problems with the kidneys. And then we'll just mention briefly about um, issues in the adult group. When I look at the urinary system, we talk about the upper and lower urinary system, and that's just to, to um, try to define it for you. I'm going to go with this mouse. It's a little bit better. But I may mention the upper urinary system, and that just relates to the kidneys and the tube that takes the urine down to the bladder of the ureter. The lower urinary tract is the bladder itself. Now, sometimes when people are talking about infections, they'll say, well, my child didn't have a urinary tract infection. They had a bladder infection or a kidney infection. Just think of a urinary tract infection as the whole. I mean, it can be anywhere. And if you want to be more specific than that, you can say, well, it's in the bladder, bladder infection, it's in the kidney. Most of that is really not that important. Um, you usually get sicker, though, if it's a kidney infection than the bladder infection. Well, there's various normal voiding stages that everyone goes through. And as a newborn and an infant, you void strictly by reflex. And that never changes your whole life. You always void by reflex, but you're doing different things. So a baby 
you'll know whether the child has spina bifida or not. You can stimulate them. It might be a cold environment. You take the diaper off. You put water in the bottom. They'll pee. Um, you start putting them in the, in the bathtub. They'll pee. You tickle the bottom of their feet. They can pee. All that's reflex and, again, normal. As you begin to go through the toddler years, then you start transitioning into a more normal adult pattern. And the way adults void and urinate isn't by actually telling yourself to urinate, but telling yourself to relax. And then when you relax and your body relaxes, that allows all the muscles in your bottom to relax. And that causes your bladder to drop down a little bit. And when that happens, you naturally get a reflex where your bladder contracts. So when you go into the, the bathroom, you never tell yourself, i got to pee. You don't want to strain. That's why we tell the kids not to strain. You need to relax and then try to go. And that's kind of the normal cycle of urinating. Oops. Going the wrong way. Okay. Now we're back on track. The only thing I want to show you here is this is supposed to be confusing. This is a picture of all the nerves that are going to the bladder, and obviously this is a boy. But this is the bladder here. And these are the nerves from your lower spine. And that's what's going on with the bladder. And that's basically the road map. And when it's normal, it's confusing. When you have anything like spina bifida or any problem with the back, any one of these nerves can go out. And we don't know what they are. And the other important thing is we can't tell what's out by just looking at the child. If you have a defect in your spine that's really close to your neck or high up, usually these nerves are intact and the bladder then just kind of contracts by reflex without any control. But as you start moving down, it's very difficult to predict. And that's again why we do different studies, particularly the urodynamic study, is to help be more specific as far as what that child needs. That also becomes very important because oftentimes as parents you're going to be talking to other families and someone might be taking care of Sally in a different way that you're taking care of Johnny and it's working for Sally and you want to say, well, can I try this for Johnny? Well, everybody's different. And unless you really know what's going on, you can't just transition one treatment regimen from one child even though they look like they have a very similar defect to another. So there's basically two sets of nerves that are set up. One set of nerves that allows your bladder to stay relaxed. So what's happening when you're just sitting here, and unless you really have to go to the bathroom, your bladder is getting signals to relax, and it's expanding like an old balloon. You know how you take a new balloon and you blow it up the first few times, it's real tight and hard to blow. After you've done that several times, it becomes real lax very easy to blow up, and that's the way the bladder should be. So nerves are stimulating the bladder to relax, but at the same time stimulating this region of the bladder, which is the bladder neck, and we talk about that when we're doing the urodynamic study, and that's supposed to tighten because what you want to do is have a nice reservoir where your bladder's relaxed, you're putting a lot of urine in it, but you don't want it coming out, so you want the bladder neck tight. In addition to that, you have a sphincter muscle, and that's the only thing you can control. You can control your external sphincter. <clears throat> this is what women are doing when they're doing Kegel exercises. And this is why after having a lot of kids, if women are having some problems leaking, you know, you'll say, well, tighten up, you know, just try to tighten up your sphincter muscle, tighten up your bottom, and you are improving some support. But you don't want the kids to do that because then they're setting up some bad habits when they're actually urinating because their problem isn't related to a muscle that's been stretched out. When you begin to urinate then, you get a signal that your bladder's kind of dropped down. And the first thing that happens is the bladder neck opens. And when that opens, that sends a lot of signals to the various nerves to start contracting the bladder. And the bladder should actually contract with a very relaxed muscle, external sphincter and a relaxed bladder neck. So it's coming out at very low pressure and just comes out naturally. What happens with children with spina bifida particularly is the signals are all mixed up. And the bladder could be contracting, but so could the bladder neck and so could the sphincter. 
And when that happens, it's just like putting your finger over the garden hose all the time. You know, if you do that real quick, the garden hose will kind of jerk, shake, and you build up pressure. That's what's happening to the bladder. One or two times isn't a big deal, but if that happens continually through the day, over weeks, it's going to cause deterioration. And very quickly, you'll have a lot of problems in the kidneys. So now what we're going to do is kind of go through each group using that normal information and trying to look at some of the things that we do to help keep the kidneys normal. So in the newborns, there's two philosophies of care. They're both very appropriate, and there's good information to support. You can do either or and get good results. We here perform more of a proactive approach. And with that, what we're trying to do is predict some of the children who are going to have a problem and treat them before that problem occurs. The downside to that is we do overtreat some kids that may not have needed it. On the other hand, you could wait for something to occur. You could wait to look for changes in your kidney where you start seeing some damage. And that's what some people will do. Basically, the difference here is whether you're doing a lot of urodynamics and intermittent catheterization. But if you're waiting for something to occur and then start treatment, you can get some back some of the changes that you've seen, but the problem is you may not get them all back. And we're also concerned by the fact that the, at the time we actually see changes on an ultrasound, there may have been a lot of changes going on in the kidney that you don't see. So the reason we like to be a little more proactive is we're not sure that all the changes you see and all the damage that occurs is reversible. So what I'm going to run through is kind of what, what we do here. But here's a picture of a bladder. Oh, let's do this one first. Here's a bladder here. And you can see how this bladder is nice and smooth. and looks kind of like a light bulb. And it really isn't that concerning. And I don't know if you can see it on there, but this is at 10 days. And this is at 9 months. And you're supposed to say, what's the difference here? Well, you can see the difference here in the bladder. This bladder is very irregular. You see all these little pockets going out, and you also see this contrast going up. This is reflux, which a lot of you are familiar with, where you re this contrast is backing into the kidney. The reason you see all these little bumps here is because, again, the bladder is a muscle. When you overwork the bladder, it's going to get strong, it's going to get ridges, and you get these little pockets. And the point here, the only difference here is nine months. This is the exact same patient. So this is how quick changes can occur. We see it in this young group. You also see it again in the teenagers when they start transitioning into their care. This is what we want to try to prevent. So the things that we try to teach people, particularly a lot of our nurses in the uh, uh, intensive care, they're all familiar with this now, but the fact that your child has a wet diaper doesn't mean that they're voiding normally means they could be leaking, they could be voiding with an abnormal pattern. And again, you're pretty clueless of what's going on unless you can test them. That's where we do urodynamics. I already mentioned that the level of the defect doesn't predict what we see. So we'll evaluate the upper tract, the kidneys, and even the bladder with an ultrasound. And in some cases, we'll do some blood work looking at how the kidneys are actually functioning. I don't do this in all cases, particularly if the ultrasound looks normal, because I know the kidney function will be normal. The lower urinary tract of the bladder we study with urodynamics. Our protocol is to do it not sooner than six weeks after the back has been closed and the shunt's been placed. And the reason for that is um, you do have some changes. You just have the natural tissue swelling that you get with any kind of surgery. And you want all that to settle down before you really start testing the kids. So we wait a minimum of six weeks, and sometimes it's longer. We do put all the children initially on a, a low dose of an antibiotic. And the reason for that is that about one in five, 20%, will have reflux, urine going up. And we want to protect that group. So in a sense, all the kids are treated for 20%. But we feel that this is a fairly low cost, not cost in dollars, but low cost as far as having any problems with the kids or morbidity. 
For intermittent catheterization, every newborn that we see here is started on intermittent catheterization. Years ago, we used to do what was called a Curday maneuver. Does, does everybody or anybody know what a Curday maneuver is? All the old folks, see? That's good. Um, <laughs> that's us, you know? Um, and that's actually good because that's what we used to do all the time. Everybody would start off and you'd do a Curday and all the parents would Curday the kids. And we learned, and I'll show you why, that in some cases that's good, but in many cases it's bad. So intermittent catheterization is the preferred technique. And we'll start all the kids out on catheterization. And we do it um, on a time schedule. And then if the volume we get is consistently less than 30 mils, and we basically just pick that number out, um, we begin to taper off and back off with the catheterization. At the time of discharge, about a little less than one-third of our children go home on catheterization. And then after our urodynamic study, after the first study, we still have about 20% that are on catheterization. Well, the people who don't like this say, well, then you took the whole group, you took 80% of your kids were subjected to catheterization while only 20% really needed it. And that's true, and, and we looked at, at that to see if it's going to cause any potential problem, and it really doesn't. So we feel it's a fairly safe thing to start off doing. This I wanted to just show, this is the year dynamic assessment, and again, I think most of you have kind of lived through this procedure more than once. But we want to look at what is effective storage and voiding or elimination of the bladder. And we're trying to determine what we call is a safe period. How long can the urine be stored in the bladder without causing damage? Um, I think I'll skip through that. So what we look at, this is just a picture of a normal curve. When you're filling the bladder, the bladder pressure should stay very low. And even when you've had a lot of Coke or coffee to drink and you feel like you're going to bust, you really got to go to the bathroom, your bladder pressure still is very low. It's all sensory perception that you're getting. Your bladder pressure is not high. You go into the bathroom, you begin to urinate, and you have a just normal voiding curve. Your bladder pressure goes up, but none of this is harmful. Then right afterwards it returns down. And there's been good studies to look at what is the critical pressure. And while it's not absolute, we use 40 centimeters of water pressure, this line, as the danger point. So when we're doing our studies, we try to determine how long the bladder stays below this line. And if it consistently goes above this line, that's when we're going to start doing different treatments. So we're looking for various different things. This is a picture of a child and I'll just kind of walk you through it. This is the bladder pressure. It's kind of spiking up here. This is every time the bladder contracts. This is a picture of the muscle. Okay, and we're checking the muscle at the same time. And what you see here is this is a muscle contraction. Okay, this is a muscle contraction. And so what we want to do is look and see when that's occurring. And if you look in this case, that's occurring exactly when the child's voiding. That shouldn't happen. The only time this muscle should contract is before you go. This is what you can control. And this is what you do when you say, you know, it's 10 more minutes before I can get off to the next exit or rest stop. So you're trying to tighten down. And so this muscle will start firing. But as soon as you go to the bathroom, it quiets down. It's very quiet. And then your bladder contracts. This is a big danger zone, though. This child will have real significant problems. So we look for this, it's called the synergy. We look for bladders that don't expand well. I mentioned that you like to have a real floppy bladder. Some are real stiff because of the way the nerves are going into the bladder. It doesn't allow it to, to expand out. So they remain real stiff and the bladder pressure again, begins to increase. Some children will have very high voiding pressure, such as this case, but there's also a group of children because they've had nerve damage to their sphincter muscle in their bladder neck, it acts like a tight washer. Very similar, I don't know if any of you used them, but there's reducing washers you can put in your shower to make it more forceful. And basically you're just putting in this little washer 
to decrease the flow. Well, that's exactly what happens here for some of the children, is the sphincter muscle becomes very fibrotic, never relaxes, doesn't do anything, but it's causing all the urine to come out at very high pressure. That's also a, a danger zone. So there's various ways to protect your upper tract or your kidneys. That's by voiding normally, which some of the children will do, or leaking at very low pressure, which many of the children will do. So oftentimes after the first urodynamic study that I see, I may tell the parents that the bladder doesn't appear normal, but it's favorable, meaning the urine is kind of going in and coming out, leaking out at low pressure. When it's not, though, when we have one of the potential problems, we do these various things. The Creday maneuver, which I, didn't men which I mentioned a little earlier, primarily intermittent catheterization, medications, sometimes surgery, which is called a vesicostomy, and I'm going to walk you through these real quickly. And then ultimately, if all of these fail or if we're dealing with an older child, we'll make the reconstruct the bladder and do an augmentation. So the Creday maneuver. All that means is you're pushing on the bladder right above the pubic bone. And here's the side view. And this is the pubic bone. So that's, you know, it's right here. And in a child, the bladder sits very close to the surface. And many times when your children's bladders are filling up, you can actually see the tummy fill up. And the parents will notice that. You know, they'll say in the morning, or at some point in time, I really see my child's bladder is much bigger. But the idea behind this is you push on the bladder, you eliminate the urine. Now, if a bladder is not emptying, we do need to get the urine out. And that is a good technique. But a few exceptions occur. One, the reflux, where urine is backing up in the kidneys, is a problem. So if the child has reflux, and I said 20% do, so one out of five is going to have that. If you're pushing on this, that puts pressure directly into the ureter and right up to the kidney. So you're doing something you don't want to do. The other thing that occurs is by pushing on the bladder, you can create a reflex, again, because all the signals are mixed up. So you create a reflex for the bladder neck to contract. And then what you're creating now is this, that picture that I showed before. You're pushing on the bladder, the urine's coming out, but it's contracting the bladder neck and the sphincter. So again, it's a very high pressure. So we would never do a Creday maneuver in a child who has one of these problems. And this child would go on intermittent catheterization. Intermittent catheterization is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Some of the, the first questions that come up, the families will ask, well, does this make my child dependent, you know, for the rest of their life on catheterization? Well, your child might require catheterization for the rest of their life. That's, again, not a, a bad thing. It's a good thing. But it doesn't make them dependent. All you're basically doing is eliminating urine and allowing the bladder to take its own course, to cycle. It needs to cycle. It needs to fill, and you need to get that urine out. So in a sense, you're providing the best opportunity for that bladder to recover if it's going to recover or improve. I mentioned that we looked at, you know, whether catheterization was harmful, and we found in our series, this was done years ago, that it really wasn't. It wasn't causing any damage. Um, we determined that about a third of the kids were on catheterization. We ended up with about 25, 20 to 25 percent after our first year dynamics. But I think the most important thing is families are aware of the technique. You know, all the families have seen their newborn catheterized, and we like at some point in time, most family members to at least try it once or twice. But not everybody does. But again, they've seen it, they know it. And down the line, if we say you're going to need to catheterize a child, while initially most people are a little apprehensive, it's much better accepted. And this is an example. This little guy, he was ambulatory, a little bit older than him, just a couple years of age. And he's cathing himself. He was so proud that he could cath himself. He wanted to show us, and he mom said we could take a picture and show everybody else. But he could put the catheter in. And there's no question that the children that start on catheterization in the newborn period pick it up much faster and are able to do it themselves much sooner. And we'll skip through all those. 
All right, so that was catheterization. There are medications that we use to help relax the bladder. All of you have tried various kinds. We have Dichapan and Detrol and, and Levsin and everything. Um, there's about seven or eight different medications. They're all in the similar family. They all cause similar side effects. Everybody reacts to them a little differently, and that's why we try to use different medications for different people. The most common side effects that we see is the flushing and the heat intolerance. And that's tough down here, particularly in the summertime. Um, and particularly for the kids who are active in sports, that can be really tough. For some of them, we end up giving the medication directly in the bladder if they're catheterizing. And that works pretty well. It's not as good as taking it by mouth. For the past five years or so, we have the long-acting medication, and a lot of you are on it. And the reason we like to go to that is side effects are reported to be much less because you're getting a smaller dose of the medication throughout the day as opposed to a large bolus at, at particular times. Oh, I should go back here. Can make your kids moody. So <laughs> you have to kind of watch that because that could be before you decide to give them away or something, you want to change medications. All right. Some of the children have such an abnormal bladder that in order to improve the situation, even when you put them on medications, things haven't changed. We usually do that. We'll start medications, start intermittent catheterization, and then restudy them with aerodynamics. And most of them do well, but there's a group that don't. And you would have to catheterize that child so often that it no longer becomes practical. If you're catheterizing the child more often than two and a half hours, it's really hard. Most of your day then is spent getting the supplies together and cleaning up. And it, you just can't do that. So for the younger kids, we will do a vesicostomy. 20 years ago or 25 years ago, this was the primary treatment for a, a child with spina bifida after you went through um, the crude maneuver. The vesicostomy is a simple procedure. Again, here's a picture of the bladder, and it's very close to the surface. So basically all we're doing is making a little incision in the tummy wall above the pubic bone directly into the bladder and pulling that right up to the surface. And we try to make it big enough so it drains continuously. And I always tell our residents the vesicostomy does three things. They drain the bladder, they stenose, which means they become too tight so we gotta operate on them again to open it up, or they prolapse, which means they're all pushed out. We gotta push them back in and operate again. So, But for the most part, we get them to drain. And it provides us a lot of time, provides us to allow the child to get older, um, and as they get older, then we have further options of things to do. So we'll move on to the toddler. Um, in the toddler now, so we've had the newborn, we try to identify the problem. All these are additive. So we're still thinking about all the problems that the newborn potentially has. But in the toddler, the things we're really trying to pick up is issues with tethered cord. So if a child's doing well, not having any problems, then up to about the age of three or four, and it depends a little bit on your child and when we'll stop, we'll, complete, we'll continue the urodynamics at least yearly, and we're comparing back. And then if we see something that's abnormal from the prior year, then we talk to the neurosurgeons and say, you know, this has really changed. We'll talk to the, you know, Dr. Conklin and say, you know, is anything else going on with the lower extremities or the feet? Because it could be the first sign of tethering. It's extremely difficult, and I don't know if um, um, if it was if Dr. Blount mentioned it this morning, but it's extremely difficult for them to determine what's tethered or not after the kids have had surgery, because the backs look very abnormal when you're looking at an MRI, and basically all the spines are tethered. And the question is, is it tethered enough to do another surgery on? Well, if I go to them and say we're starting to see some changes here, that gives them a little more information as far as what they need to do. In the toddler group, we'll continue to look at the kidneys by ultrasound in addition to the urodynamics. And I usually do that every six months through the age of two. Um, if a child has a 
bladder hostility, some kind of abnorm abnormality, and we haven't stabilized, then we do urodynamics frequently, at least every six months. This, I'll have to walk you through this. This is a picture of an ultrasound of a kidney, and if I outline it here, you'll see it. There's a kidney here on the left side and a kidney here on the right side, okay? They look, it's just kind of solid tissue. You see a little white line here. That's the area that collects the urine. You see a white line here. That's normal. So this child has had normal kidneys, but all of a sudden they come back doing perfectly well, not having any problems, no infections. We get an ultrasound, but not too hard to convince you this is different. Here you've got the kidney here, but then you've got some round ball here and kind of fingers going out here. And that's what's called hydronephrosis. That's urine that's beginning to collect in the kidney. Now, you'd have to see a lot of these, but that's, that's already getting pretty bad at this stage. So something's happened. And if you come in and say, well, my child's been fine. He's not been having urinary infections. We know something else is going on. So this would be one that we would do urodynamics on, even if it wasn't time. If we saw a change, then we talked to the neurosurgeons. And so here's the bladder we can see, which looks pretty good, but you see this little thing down here, this little thing down here, that's the ureter, that's bringing the urine from the kidney. Normal is not seeing it. So the fact that the bladder's full, we see this, we see that, it's a red flag. We did do urodynamics. He did appear to have a tethered cord. That was treated. We also started this child on intermittent catheterization. So about four months later, the kidneys have returned to normal. I can't honestly tell you, though, if it was just all from the tethering or the fact that we now started the child on catheterization, but the combination was important, you know, for that child. Now, this would be an example in a sense of a reactive type treatment, and this is what some people rely on completely. The problem in this case would be if you didn't have your baseline studies, you really wouldn't know if you had a change, and then you wouldn't be able to talk to the neurosurgeon and say, we've got a change here. Okay. In the adolescence, now you want to maintain all the things we talked about. You want to make sure that we've gotten everything stabilized, and hopefully we have. We have the child on some kind of regimen that's pretty stable and they're doing well. And this is the time where you want to start working on gaining urinary continence, or gaining continence really, both of urine and bowel. And there's several things. When we're talking about the bladder, there's really four things that we need to address. In order for you to stay dry, you need to have a bladder that's a good capacity, it's a good reservoir. You know, it doesn't matter if everything's working perfectly normal and you can only hold an ounce. You're still going all the time. So you have to have a good capacity. You have to have the bladder that expands nicely at low pressure, that's called good compliance. You have to have something to keep the urine in, that's the resistance and you have to be able to eliminate it. Every time we address one of these things, we can cause potential damage to the kidneys, and that's why we're careful in trying to do all this. The questions we always get asked is, you know, when you're talking about urinary continence, these four questions, who benefits, at what cost, at what risk, and when do you begin? I'm only gonna really talk in this lecture on what the cost and the risk is. As far as who benefits, I think all the kids can benefit. The reason I say I think all the kids can benefit is most do, but I think some families do very well with their child maintaining whatever kind of continence um, structure they've developed. And we have a lot of teenagers, a lot of uh, older children who aren't continent and function extremely well, and you wouldn't know the difference. So the fact that continence has a lot of benefits, it may not be practical or appropriate for everybody. When you begin is also independent. It is dependent more on the family than a specific age. But what's the cost? This is not in dollars. The cost is changing your lifestyle. In most cases, you're going to have to begin intermittent catheterization. And that can be a change in what you're currently doing. And if you're to the point where you want to begin continence, 
very good. It's appropriate. And you learn that it's not that hard to get it into your schedule. Medications, uh, the cost of medications basically is the reactions and side effects, you know, kind of working through that. And we can do that in most cases. This is where it starts getting a little dicey, though. You get to a point where there's some children who respond favorably and all they need for continence is intermittent catheterization or medications. But others do require surgery. And the important point with surgery we always talk about is the point of no return. And that's why in all the kids, I won't operate on a child until the family shows me that they're catheterizing. And it's not uncommon. Someone will come in and say, well, I, we catheterized for a week. You know, Johnny's not dry. We stopped and we're ready for surgery. Well, the, the point is not necessarily just that you're going to be dry. The point is to get it into your system to make sure you're doing it, make sure the school's comfortable with it. Because once we operate, there's no return. I mean, you can't go back through. Before you operate, if you don't catheterize, you kind of revert to just your wedding state. And you're not really damaging your kidneys unless we're doing catheterization for another reason. Um, but once you operate, if you don't catheterize, you can have serious problems. Your bladder can expand, your bladder can rupture. And while that can happen even if you're catheterizing, um, the incidence increases significantly if you don't. So we need to make sure that the families remain compliant or rigid with their catheterization. What's the risk? When any time we operate on the bladder or, or start any incontinence program, we're potentially risking damage to the kidneys. With children on catheterization, We'll start every child, for the most part, without medications. But half of them will have infections. We know that. So half of our children long-term require, require a low dose of an antibiotic. Um, we don't start all the kids on it initially just because there's some that don't need it. We like to kind of sort out who doesn't need it. But infections can be an issue. Anybody who's catheterizing can potentially form stones. And that's one of the things that we look at at least yearly as an abdominal film to see if any stones are forming. This risk increases significantly if you've done surgery. And we're looking at the risks, again, of the medications and the side effects from that. And then, obviously, it's very clear there's risks when you do surgery. Even though we think and we want all of our surgeries to work perfectly, I can tell you they don't and many of you realize they don't. When we talk about surgery, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this at all, but we're talking about an augmentation. We need to do something to make the bladder bigger. And conceptually, it's hard for people to, to understand what we do. There are a few options, but basically the most tried and true and reliable option we have right now is using bowel, small bowel particularly. We've used uh, every kind of, every segment of bowel you can talk about. We've used the colon, we've used the stomach. They all have some benefits and, and disadvantages, but for the most part, if you have a lot of small bowel, we like to use it. It produces the least amount of mucus. It produces the least amount of problems with losing salt in your system, particularly when you're getting sick. Um, and it provides very low pressure. And basically what we do is take the intestines. The intestines you can just think of as a long tube. We take a segment out, kind of like this U. It looks like a horseshoe. And then this dotted line is where we make an incision, and we open it up. So this is kind of with it opened. And then we sew one wall together, and then we pull this down and sew the other wall together and make it kind of like a dome and just expand it. And then we put this actually back on the bladder. That fits right on, it's like a camp. And then with time, over a very short period of time, this expands. And because this doesn't have the, the abnormal nerves to it, and doesn't have the same type of muscle that the bladder has, it'll expand very quickly. And some children will allow it to expand and catheterize once or twice a day. We don't like that. 
because this then it gets really, really big, and then you're really putting yourself at risk for eventually popping, and that can occur. But that's essentially what we're trying to do. So what's the, the potential risks to that? Well, we already talked about some of them. These are stones. That's what stones looks like. Um, anytime we operate on a child, we have a potential risk of a small bowel obstruction, you know, having something with the intestine. It's something else that I should have on here, but um, I don't, is having a shunt problem. We put the shunts at risk. Now, in most cases, we can perform these procedures without having an issue with the shunt. But every now and then, you know, we'll have an issue where the shunt's going to need to be revised. As soon as we put mucus in the bladder, and that comes from bowel, and you'll see it floating around for your children who have been augmented, and it always looks mucusy. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It always kind of has a funky smell to it. Again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but that does promote bacteria and growth. For all the children who are catheterized, whether you're on medicine or not, if you do a urine culture, it's going to be positive. And we get blamed for everything. Every time a child sneezes, if they check, the pediatrician checks the urine, it's positive. It's a urinary infection. They're not all urinary infections. Sometimes we'll take the blame, but not for everything. And so we really try to encourage families to be aware of that. And if they're dealing with their pediatrician to have a, a you know, a, a short fuse and telling them to not necessarily treat, because we don't treat all bacteria in the bladder. Um, so some bacteria is actually not bad. The other problems we've mentioned stones, I mentioned rupture, tumors are something that can occur, mixing the bowel with the bladder. We actually don't know how serious this is. We do know it occurs. Every couple of years we kind of look at it and some people will present large series. And one of the interesting features this year at the meeting was that, well, maybe it's not happening quite as often as we think. We do recommend surveillance, um, looking at the kids 10 years after you have an augmentation. About every year to 18 months to two years, we like to look into the bladder to see if there's any abnormal growths, tumors. And that's pretty much routine, and almost every institution will do that. And there's data coming out now that we might not need to be that aggressive. We're not going to change here, but um, it, it may not be as helpful as we think. Um, how can we minimize some of the risks? The most important thing is being consistent and draining your bladder, um, using the largest catheter you can. And it makes a big difference moving up from an 8 to a 10, 10 to 12, 12 to 14. There is a 16, but there's very little to be gained from going 14 to 16. So traditionally we stop at 14. Mucus easily flows through that, um, and that's where we like to go. But it's important to kind of reposition the catheter when you're putting it in. For some children, young adults, we actually have them reposition their body because when you're cathing, you're usually cathing from above if you're using some kind of channel. Even if you're cathing from the urethra from below, the catheter kind of pokes in, and you're not always draining everything in the bladder. I'm going to move through some of this. Uh, Okay. How can we control some infections? Just some basic things. On some children, we will use a low dose of an antibiotic. And our rule of thumb basically is if you have three symptomatic infections where you really get sick and we think it's the urine in a six-month period, then we put you on prophylaxis. Or if you have another underlying problem where you have urine backing up in your kidneys. We do like using cranberry juice. There's a couple reasons for it. One, if you actually like it, it allows you to kind of flush through your system so you're getting some fluids. But in addition to that, there's some components in the cranberry juice that prevent bacteria from adhering to your bladder. And for someone who particularly is on long-term catheterization, that's helpful. In addition, the cranberry juice has components in it that combat some of the bacteria and can improve the odor. So in the kids who have just are chronic, chronically colonized and have a lot of mucus, if you take a cranberry uh, juice or a supplement, you can combat that. Now, supplements are as good as the cranberry juice. 
Um, and I always recommend just buying the cheapest fun, you know, thing you can find um, and taking it. There's also a lot of benefit in probiotics, and that's just the, the active cultures that are in yogurt. Now, there is likely going to be some information on what yogurt is better than another. You know, like you hear a lot of information on Activia is good for bowel, and it's true. It has a particular type of, of culture colony in it that's protective and helpful for your bowel. That's also good for the bladder, but it's not as specific as some of the, the um, cultures can be. And so a lot of the companies now are investigating various cultures that they can put in yogurt or, or different food products or that you can take, like culturel, things like that, um, that might be more helpful for the bladder. But for the present time, just taking any kind of yogurt or probiotic lactobacillus is good if you're having recurrent infections. Now, things change. And the reason I put this up is we change things all the time. Um, we do something that we think is helpful and good, and we learn over years that maybe there's something better. It's interesting because the bladder augmentation with small bowel is what we keep falling back to. And even though that's not perfect and has a lot of risks, that's what everything continually gravitates to. Something else new comes along, it doesn't work. About 15 years ago, what we were doing was cutting the muscle in the bladder to cut away all the muscle and just leave the lining. And that's what you see here. This is just a, a tissue-thin lining of the bladder that's been opened up. And we thought that if we took away all the muscle, that, that would allow the bladder to expand. Um, and it did initially, but it contracts down. So it was never very helpful. And the children that had this done um, ended up reverting to a formal augmentation. And then it was about a little over 10 years ago that the big rage was stomach, taking the stomach instead of bowel. And there's properties in the stomach that were very helpful. The stomach is, produces acid. That kills off bacteria. So with that, we improved a lot of the problems that the kids were having with chronic infections. In addition, the, the stomach is a totally different type of sac and muscles here, and it expands very nicely. So we were doing this on children for a while, but what we found out is if you had any sensation at all, or if you leaked and you had a stoma, the acid from the stomach would really burn and irritate the skin. In addition to that, because you're excreting all this acid, when the kids would get sick with any kind of um, uh, viral diarrhea, something like that, they would lose so much acid from their system that they'd really get sick. And I don't think anyone now is using just strictly stomach by itself. There are some conditions where that's all we have and we'll use it. Or now, for the most case, if we use it, we use it in combination with something else to kind of buffer. And then some of you are aware that we were doing the, the neobladder, the new bladder, the regenerated bladder. I know I talked with many of you in the audience about that. And that is something that is tissue engineering, and you hear a lot about it in the news, and it's the big rage. It still is now. Um, there were 10 children that were done in the first study, and we happened to do four of them here. We had the largest series. And basically what it looked like is this is the artificial bladder here. This is going in. And what you can't see, this is kind of like a styrofoam top, and this is seated with the cells. We would take cells from the child, culture it, and grow it in the tissue. And it would come like this, and then we put it back on, and then we'd cover it with stomach tissue, or tissue that lines the, the intestine, the momentum. And while everybody was encouraged, I can tell you none of us have had real good results with this. And so it's a little disappointing from the point of view of it's not going to be a quick fix. There is potential benefit if you can wait years to allow this to grow, but something over a matter of so many months to a year is probably not going to be effective. And the, the point of that is it's just a, another procedure that has kind of come and gone. 
Some of you may be aware of what's called the Zhao procedure. You'll hear about this. A lot of has been written about this. Um, and this has to do with the nerve rerouting. And there's a study, there's a couple institutions that are doing studies. And basically the idea behind this is you transfer some healthy nerves in your back to your bladder. And by scratching or pushing on an area of your abdomen, you're able to contract the bladder. The results out of China by Zhao are very, very good. Problem is no one's been able to reproduce it. And it's questioned whether his results are also as good as he reports. So there is a study going on. Um, there's only one institution in the country right now that is going to get NIH funding for that. And we actually don't want a lot of programs doing it. We're very concerned, because there are some programs doing this now, that a lot of families are going to be requesting this. And this is not without potential risk. Most of the children in the first studies had to be ambulatory, because you wanted to use nerves that were going to the leg, legs, and you needed to know that they would work. And they would have side effects from this. OK. I I think I'm going to skip through creating outlet resistance. So I'm running out of time here. The only thing with the outlet resistance, I will go back. Basically, what we're trying to do is create a muscle. And we do it several different ways. We can do it with tissue that we create a sling out, and kind of make a noose around the bladder neck, and then suspend that up. That's what we do in most cases. Some of the children will have an artificial sphincter. I think that works real good, but I don't like the combination of the sphincter and catheterizing. But when we do this, what we learned is that as soon as you create resistance to the bladder, the bladder sees a new blockage, and you can unmask a lot of problems with the bladder. So there are some children that you think might just need a bladder neck sling or a belt. These are the children we'll watch closely because we may promote some problems with the bladder that weren't identified earlier. So we may unmask some bladder hostility. The only way we know that is to, again, follow closely with urodynamics and with uh, ultrasound imaging. For many of the children, um, catheterization through the normal urethra is easy, and for some not. It's a little bit easier for boys than girls because even if you're sitting in a chair for a boy, you can get to the penis and catheterize. Some it's not that easy, but for, for many it is. But for girls, it's very difficult. And if you're in a chair, or even if you're not in a chair, you have to reposition yourself. Oftentimes, you have to lay down. It becomes very hard. It's doable, but it's hard. And for those children, then we provide an alternative. We create a little channel that we use to pass a catheter in. Now, years ago, we used strictly the appendix, and that's what you have here. The appendix is great, nice normal channel, takes the catheter well, it's real easy to put in the bladder. The only problem with this is the past several years is we've been using this for the bowel. So you can catheterize the bowel, and then we've got to create a channel for the bladder. It makes it a little harder. That's why when you go through surgeries and we say it's going to be 12 hours, that's why it's 12 hours creating all these things. Um, when we talk about continence, we learn that you can make a child continent of urine, but if you don't help them with their bowel, they're not happy. The families aren't happy. And when we're doing surgeries, if we do a 12-hour surgery, we spend an hour at the most on the bowel and 11 hours in the bladder. And if you ask the families and the kids, they are much happier that the continent of bowel in the bladder. So it tells you that all this work sometimes is helpful, but this is what the families appreciate. And what we do there, there's several different things that can be done, but we basically take the appendix, bring this up through the belly button or some, some part of the body wall, and allows you to put a catheter in here. And basically, you're just flushing the colon. Instead of using an enema where you're trying to put water in and then let it drain out. You're basically just putting the water in and you're letting it work around. We've learned with this that everybody's a little different. 
we can't tell you how much water you're going to need. We use tap water. Other people use different things, but it's pretty good evidence to show that tap water is very effective. But how much is it going to take? Hard to tell. On average, between 700 and 1,000 mils or liter, uh, cc's. It usually takes anywhere from 40 minutes to 60 minutes. It is helpful to kind of change positions. Kids with spina bifida particularly have very redundant bowel, and it can take twists and turns. And early on, families would tell us this all the time, and it really didn't pick up on it until the past couple of years. As I say, I put in five, 600 cc's of tap water, and it didn't go anywhere. It's still in there. And it's because they're kind of their colon's looped and kinked. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's going to be the next day, and they turn in their chair, and it all comes out. So you want to try to make sure if you're irrigating that you are getting out pretty much close to what you're putting in. But for some of the kids, we have them move. Some of the parents will actually push on the tummy or massage a little bit, and that helps the, the uh, fluid go through. We're running a little late, but we do need to spend time here. This is a big, a big red flag is young adults. It's like any teenager. You've got a teenager, it doesn't matter if they're spina bifida or not. They're a teenager, and they're trouble. So you've got to be careful. Hopefully, we have normal kidneys. And hopefully you've achieved whatever status that is good for you um, for your continence. And it's then up to everybody, and particularly the child, then to be able to maintain that. And so you're trying to transition your care. Um, we'll do that. We want to make sure that um, everybody's on board with everything. Because if you start getting deterioration, it's really basically one of three things. It's lack of attention, and that could be a lack of attention on the physician's part, not following up, not doing things. It can be lack of attention on the child's part, not doing what they should be doing, and lack of attention on the parent of monitoring. We don't want you to do everything for the child, but we do want you to still monitor what's going on. The teen syndrome, this is what I call the teen syndrome, is first denial. Um, the kids will get through a point where, I mean, they don't want to be different than anyone else. They don't want to have to go and, into the bathroom and catheterize when the other kids are running in and running out. Um, they want to pretty much forget about it, deny they have a problem. And that occurs. Um, they want to conform with everybody else. It's also not a big deal. It's a very hard, and if you think back when you were younger, I mean, it, I mean you can talk to kids about the damage that's going to occur. But I mean, you know, they're thinking, well, it's not going to happen until I'm old like you, you know. But it all catches up. And it's real hard prospectively to put it in perspective about what potential damage is going to occur that's going to stay with you the rest of your life. Um, another thing is out of sight, out of mind. Some of the kids, just because of learning issues, need a reminder. And I see this more often in some of the children who are in chairs. If they put their calf supplies on the back, they forget about it. And it's not a matter of they want to forget about it. They, they just get preoccupied with everything else, and they're doing their homework and having fun, and they forgot about having it. So for that child, it's always best maybe to have the supplies on the side, having them wear a watch that can ding every hour, and then you can have a little card if you have, you're supposed to calf in a certain hour, and they just look and say, it's 4 o'clock, I'm supposed to calf. Um, so it's 4 o'clock. Anybody who wants to leave can. We just have a few more minutes. <laughs> if you want to sit through this, you can. Um, but it's mainly a shift of responsibility. So it's understanding the goal of being independent. And I think education is very important, and it's really understanding why you need to do the things you're doing. Again, it doesn't matter what Johnny's doing or Sally's doing or the medications they're taking. You need to know why you're taking your medicines, why it's important, and why you need to calf. You need to have everybody on board, the kids on board, and why a schedule is important. Um, and you need to start having them make a decision in their, in their health care. And we'll have some kids, you know, who 
I tell them the next point for them is a major surgery, and they don't want to do it, and I don't want to do it. I mean, these are kids who their whole life have been told they've got to have another surgery. You know, now we're to a point where they get to choose, in a sense. Being continent necessarily isn't going to be life-threatening. It's a good thing. It can create more independence. But if they're not ready for it, I wouldn't put them through it. Um, as caretakers, you need to begin to shift the responsibility to the teen. You need to start letting them do things. But that doesn't mean that you just let them do it. And I hear that all the time is, you know, Johnny's not caffeine. Well, I gave him all the supplies, but he's not caffeine. You have to make sure, I mean, if you send a catheter in to school or two catheters, when they come home, you want to check and see where those catheters are used. You know, if they're giving themselves medicine, you can have them counted out. And every couple of days, you should be checking that medicine and see if they're taking it. That's kind of your responsibility to monitor the progress. So you're not doing it, but you do need to monitor it. And unfortunately, we see teenagers who can do a lot of things. They can go in the bathroom and play around for 15, 20 minutes and not calf, come out, you know, and they think that everything's done. Um, that could be a problem. Um, so this is just talking about, you know, things we talked about, looking, monitoring the catheters. Adult care, hopefully by the time you've gotten to the adult point, everything is stabilized. And actually, once you get through puberty in your teen years, if your kidneys are normal, they should remain normal the rest of your life if you stay up on top of things. And you can live quite old with good kidneys. Um, adult care, fortunately here we're improving things. We've got a very good handle on transitioning to adult care. We've got a very good resource next door with Dr. Jackson. Um, so we're fortunate. There's a lot of programs that don't have that. You know, after you've been in the environment of a pediatric center for a long time, you're kind of just left to the adult world. And it's not as, you know, um, cozy uh, and warm and friendly sometimes as, as the pediatric clinics. And that's hard to, to deal with. And because of that, a lot of people start, you know, backtracking on what needs to be done. In addition to that, there's many institutions or many programs that don't have adult specialists or don't have someone who is familiar with all the things we've done as kids. Um, one of those issues are with women, particularly. Gynecologic care is important in women with spina bifida, just like it is in any woman. And for a lot of the women, if you've had contractures of your lower extremities, you need special tables. You need something that you can transition in. Particularly if you're in a chair, you don't want you know, the exam table up here you know, with stirrups sticking out here. You can't get into it. Um, so you need to be in a program that has that, and that's one of the things that Dr. Jackson has. Obstetric care is also important. Women with spina bifida who have been reconstructed can have children. It's one of the things we get asked all the time. Am I limited because we had this surgery no longer having children? Not true, you can. But there are some considerations and things that we need to be aware of um, regarding that woman, and we'd recommend that their health care is undertaken at a large center so they have the support of a urologist and they can be there at the time of delivery if anything needs to be done. So finally, you know, basically it comes down to doing the right thing. Um, when we get new changes, we want to make sure that we try to do studies and trials appropriately. All the centers, even though we have a large center here, our numbers are fairly small when you're looking at new changes. So we need to work cooperatively with other programs. And you really want to randomize things to truly see if something's working. So this is one of the things that we'd like to do as we're moving forward. And some of the things that Betsy's been working on with the electronic record and a lot of the things that you've signed up for for keeping track of various things of our data becomes important for this in the future. So I think we'll end there. And um, it's over time. But if anybody wants to stay around for questions, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you for attending this session.
Because meeting your needs is important to us, we need your feedback on this presentation. Please take a few moments to complete our evaluation, which can be located by clicking on the presenter's name located to the left on your screen. It will only take a few clicks of your mouse to provide us information to make the SBU experience better for you and others. If you have any questions relating to SBU, please contact us at sbu at sbaa.org.